Hello and welcome to Fidelity Connects, a Fidelity Investments Canada podcast connecting you to the world of investing and helping you stay ahead. Today we're joined by portfolio managers Jeff Moore and Michael Plage as they discuss the fixed income landscape. Jeff and Michael also touch on topics such as the positive correlation between stocks and bonds, the sustainability of the 60-40 portfolio, and what steeper unwinds mean for the U.S. Treasury curve. With strong bond market flows, there have been significant returns, leading to an increased demand for treasuries in this sector. Jeff and Michael also touch on what geopolitical tensions could mean for fixed income. They explain how these escalations could accelerate Fed cut rates and benefit bonds, but also negatively impact equities. This podcast was recorded on August 20th, 2024. Hi, Mike. Hi, Jeff. How are you today? Really well. Very well. Very well. There's sort of a question after the volatility um, and seeing a rush into bonds, people concerned. If the whole idea of bonds and stocks being correlated, which is not the purpose of a 60-40, I guess you'd say, was transitory. Was that a transitory thing? Can we begin with you, Jeff? Sure. So in in a way, it was transitory. We had a confluence of things happening in 2020, 2021. A lot of it, we had monster fiscal policy that unfortunately in the U.S. stimulated into a full employment economy. We didn't know they were full employment at the time, but it was pretty clear as full employment. So the price level started moving. And then you had the Federal Reserve at near zero rates. And so the combo of very stimulant monetary policy and a monster sort of Keynesian stimulus that didn't need to go anywhere led to inflation. And it looked like bonds were uh, co-integrated, if you want to look at it, with stocks. For sure, for sure. And Michael, coming out of what, I mean, it looks like we're walking into the the easing cycle pretty quickly here into September. Uh, We're not actually in it, but almost no one believes that it won't begin. What then in terms of the correlation? It should, it should again end, or do you expect it to be, have some wobbles as we normalize here? Yeah, so it's going to end. And I I do think stocks and, and, and fixed income uh, securities will be inversely correlated again, and the benefit of a diversified portfolio will once again exist. And the 60-40 uh, is not dead. Uh, long live the 60-40 for a diversified portfolio. But we may have another period of positive correlation, but this is the kind that nobody's going to complain about because stocks and bonds are both uh, appreciating at the same time. And when does that happen? That happens when inflation is coming down towards the Fed's target. It happens when the Fed's reaction function is to become less easy, uh, less restrictive and, and starts to get easier. So we're getting the inverse where 2022 was a complete reset in yields. Uh, we call that the nowhere to hide uh, year. You couldn't own anything. You were underwater in just about every asset class. Um, 2023, 2024 looks like everything rallies. So at, you know, bo- both stocks and bonds are appreciating. We will get to the point where the Fed reaches a neutral rate. We will have more balance. You know, whether that's three, four, five, or six cuts from now, we'll see. We'll see how the data comes in. But we are going to get to the point where that inverse correlation uh, can return. And by the way, we've seen two uh, episodes. We've said the, the inverse correlation, the benefit of owning bonds, the ballast in your portfolio, that, that's, that's existed. It's been kind of hiding under the daily positive correlation for a couple of years. But both in the regional bank crisis in March of 2023 and the miss on non-farm payrolls, just a couple of weeks ago, when equities were selling off hard, bonds were rallying. So the, the inverse correlation that we that we that we know and love is there. It's just kind of hiding under the covers. Um, but it, it, I do think the positive correlation is a transitory effect. Jeff, as we walk towards, it looked like you know the jobs report, which is probably going to see some revisions. But but it, it was one of the catalysts that, that caused all that volatility. There was a, a yen carry trade that fit into the the story as well. But certainly, there seemed to be a shift from sort of staring at CPI intently to the labor story over the course of the last few weeks. Um, employees taking center stage for for the from the Fed's perspective. Can you just speak to that? Like, what are we watching there? What are they watching there? What are you yeah, watching? so you have the Federal Reserve. You have the dual mandate. So you have inflation on one hand, jobs on another. Inflation looks like the battle's been won. I think the Fed will say in Jackson Hole, mission accomplished, we've won. We're, you know, so we can start that rate cutting cycle. But in the background, I think they're looking at jobs and they're trying to figure out how strong is the economy? Where are the jobs? There's, and the problem with the jobs data is it's subject to massive revision. It's it, a lot of it's, uh, I call it 1920s technology. 
it's mm. it's very difficult with specificity to say this is where we really are. That's why a lot of times you hear about the NBER does re with the recession. They, they'll they'll announce the recession six months after it happens. So if you're the Federal Reserve, you've won on inflation, so now you're turning your attention to jobs and just making sure that the jobs market sort of fits what your narrative is. And so watch that data now. Like every month, it's now that it's not the CPI anymore that's must watch. It's now going to be the jobs data. So that's that's sort of the way it is. Michael, would you say the the Fed is cutting now to to become less restrictive? Are they are they concerned even about like a deflationary piece of the story? This gets into the is there a recession coming story, but uh, or is it just to be less restrictive? I think that's actually the most important question we should be asking ourselves right now. Is is the Fed still cutting to become less restrictive? Or does the Fed actually see something in the data where they feel they need to, to cut to stimulate the economy? Yeah. Those are two very, very different things. And I think the impact on the equity market will be uh, could be uh, in polar opposite directions. Where a less restrictive Fed, I think the, uh, the equity market will welcome lower rates because the Fed is declaring victory on, in, on, the, on the battle against inflation uh, and returning to a more normal environment. Whereas the latter, where the employment data is coming in weaker, uh, raises the probability of recession. So I, I think that the Fed actually doesn't want to cut 50 uh, in September right out of the gates, because I do think that potentially could send the wrong message uh, to, to the equity market. And that, that is, um, uh, I think they'll ease into it, go, go once in, in September maybe once in November, once in December, which is a little less than what's priced into the market today. But I think that's safe. And I do think the Fed has four weeks or so uh, to, to talk the market, to, to price in those, you know, what they want to do. Jackson Hole uh, will be the first of those uh, uh, opportunities to send that message. Remind us what, what Jackson Hole actually is in terms of a forum, in terms of central bankers from around the world. One of the big stories, of course, is, is the the different paces and also sort of timing of rate cuts around the world, the differential between countries. What do you think as they sort of crack heads around the table there, they're, they're trying to get at, what is the point of this meeting versus last year? Well, again, I think it's to communicate first and foremost, uh, the Fed's uh, uh, kind of direction of travel and, and magnitude in terms of, of rate cuts. But clearly uh, rates are coming down basically everywhere around the world, except Japan, right? So that's the that's an interesting dynamic, and that's part of the catalyst for the, the carry trade unwind, where Japanese rates are potentially moving higher, U.S. rates and other rates around the world are moving lower. Uh, interest rate parity, IRP, uh, would, would tell you then in that case, the, Jap the Japanese yen should be strengthening um, relative to most currencies around the world. And that's what we saw. Um, so even though the Fed doesn't have currency, as, as one of their uh, mandates, they've got price stability and full employment. Um, they certainly do consider the strength of the currency in their, you know, in, in their, in their policies and, and the impact, particularly when it has an outsized impact. I do think that the, do the dollar's been a juggernaut. Fortress North America has been uh, supporting the dollar for, for years now. Um, a, a lower interest rate differential between the U.S. and the rest of the world as the, as the Fed really starts to cut. Um, could be a headwind, but again, the, the U.S. economy is extraordinarily strong. The Canadian economy is very strong. So we'll actually be watching the interest rate differential between the, the Bank of Canada and the, and the U.S. Fed as well. You think the Canadian economy is really strong? I'm, 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 like, I'm glad to hear that, but do you? I, I do. I do. Um, I think the, the Canadian economy is strong. I think the U.S. economy is strong. I think I actually think the Mexican economy is strong. I think you, the North American uh, block is actually doing very well relative to the rest of the world. Yeah, and I think where our heads are at is like, but we're, there's vulnerabilities out there. That's, and so that's probably where your head is at, Pamela. It's like, when you think about Canada, well, we have we so much of, debt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, how, housing prices are so high. There's so, many, so much to do with immigration. Price levels are on the move. You can see the vulnerabilities are, are massive. So Mike's right, like the economies look great right now in a steady state, but if something comes along and kind of dislodges them, and one of the fears that we have, right, not fears, but ex expectations almost, is that we're going to have to get some of these deficits under control, U.S., Canada, around the world. And that's probably going to be done as much through tax increases, hard to cut spending. People will get mad at you for doing that. And so when you do that, 
you can imagine that sort of that Keynesian stimulus that we had three years ago, we actually have pulled forward GDP into these years. And in the out years, we have a little less GDP as the tax headwind starts to hit, as people have to, you know, consumption gets hit a little bit on the side to pay for taxes um, and, and to start reducing the deficit. And so when we think about those vulnerabilities, it's that debt paradigm, it's housing prices, they're all front and center. But like Mike said, for the here and now, the economy yeah. seems okay. Which is part of the reason we're still pretty excited about the bond market. Yeah. Is you know the, there are vulnerabilities. And yep. you know, we saw it, we saw it two weeks ago in, in the US, and there is leverage in the system. Yes. Not as big as it was in say 2007, but there's still leverage in the system. So any of the vulnerabilities that expose themselves, you know, there could be volatility in the equity markets. And, and again, that's that that should be great for the for the bond market. So what, what did you see out of that volatility? I mean, um, I, I think you've mentioned before, if we go back to the you know the bank, mini banking crisis, um, March of 2023, uh, and then this volatility event, it, it showed that bonds is where people went to hide, to be when you're concerned, that's where they went. Um, you expect that to happen again. Um, what what ultimately are you seeing in terms of flows? Is, is it sort of a, People got spooked and went into the bond market. Like, are you watching that as a as a phenomena? Yeah, uh, we've seen we've seen tremendous flows into the bond market, you know, broadly and, and here at Fidelity. Um, and I think the you remember at the beginning of 2023, we wrote the the white paper. If you don't love bonds today, you probably just don't like bonds. We um, all hope that that's basically viral. <laughs> it, it is true. It was true then, and it's true now. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about double digit returns in the bond market and the potential for outsized returns and the potential for uh, ballast in your diversified portfolio. And, and we're seeing, uh, you know, I mentioned that, that we've had a 10 percent or 12 percent return in multi-sector bonds since, you know, since September. Um, you know, we don't, you know, people don't pay as much attention. I think they're focused on the on the equity markets, but you know, we're getting it. And we haven't really had a, a full retracement in in yields. So yields are still high. Uh, the, the forward-looking returns still look compelling, and, and our scenario analysis still says that a double-digit return uh, is a high-probability event based on the market and, and our portfolios. Yeah, and can I just step back? But when we think about that Japanese event, you know, so the yes. carry trade falling apart and the volatility spike of a few weeks ago, a lot of what happens in carry trades, that's code for someone's got leverage on. And as soon as the carry trade starts going against you, you have to post collateral. And what is acceptable collateral? If you're Canadian, it's government Canada bonds. If you're American, it's treasuries. So one of the reasons collateral treasuries do so well anytime something breaks is because the client's forced to go buy that collateral and post it, that post that margin at the bank. And all your everybody on the uh, on the call here knows this stuff. And so when you see something like the carry trade that's been there for so long, even a piece of it starts to unwind. What you're really watching when treasuries rock and roll is collateral getting pushed. What else yeah. on that? I mean, is there more to go on that? We've heard that actually that was the big move and it did unwind, but you wonder. Yeah, so I, I think the hard part with knowing how big the carry trade is, is you have to ask yourself how far will the Japanese government or the Bank of Japan go in terms of raising rates? So right now they've had, they had YCC for decades, it seems like. They've, the, this, the Bank of Japan owns over 50% of the Nikkei you think about that. So this was quantitative easing run amok, right? And so now you have a new right. governor, Governor Crota retired. The new governor's trying to find his way through. And so like any good government, they'll go slow and ponderously and because they're scared. They're not really sure what, if I touch this, what will happen next, right? And so, but you can almost like Mike was saying, take to the bank that the Bank of Japan has to raise rates to some level that is market clearing, not government cleared. And that, how does that process look? I think what we saw a few weeks ago is the Bank of Japan goes, ooh, better not touch that for a while. But so keep an eye on that. And so that those carry trades are, are vulnerable. Okay, so they are still, I mean, it's a possibility that they're still, they're still oh, that. So it's still monster. So it, you, you basically started the carry trade unwind. It's massive still. Because think about it. If you have a carry trade on, where do you go? You, you want to, other than deleverage. U.S. Treasuries. A carry trade is pretty structural for a lot of investors. And there's still a massive interest rate differential. Yeah. Yeah, borrowing yen is still the cheapest 
uh, funding vehicle out there. Yeah. So, you know, it's just too tempting. Yeah. So, yeah. but but that means, you know, if, they, if investors do reestablish the carry trade, even if most of it was unwound and we have no idea, then it's, you know, we're vulnerable to another shock again. And maybe the first one was a tremor and maybe the next one is the earthquake. You know, who knows? We'll see. I don't know. Yeah. So what is all, speaking of unwinds, what, tell us a little bit about uh, the steepener that, that we sort of expected to work soon, the, the idea of the inverted yield curve, which has been there for some time. Let, let's talk about unwinds positioning, uh, where you see some of these things that have been in the market for some time now, actually. Yeah, the steepener. I, so it's interesting. The steepener was always a sign of, there's a bit of a tangent, but steepener was a sign of, a, of, of a, uh, a, an impending near-term recession. Uh, and that was two years ago. We were, you know, everybody was talking about the inverted yield curve and recessions around the corner. To me, it seems like the SOM rule has actually replaced the uh, the yield curve as as this as the signal. Um, but we'll see. And that has to do with employment and the trend in employment. Um, but we do like the steepener. We've liked the, liked the steepener for a long time. We like the belly of the Treasury uh, U.S. Treasury curve. Why? Because the Fed will eventually be cutting rates. And when they do, uh, the twos and fives should really outperform the 10-year part of the curve and the 30-year part of the curve. So we're starting to see that. And generally what happens is curves invert gradually and steepen suddenly. So again, back to those two examples, uh, in the regional bank crisis, the curve was inverted by 100 basis points, twos, tens, and it's it steepened to 50. So that was a 50 basis point rally in twos relative to tens. We saw the same exact thing uh, after the non-farm payrolls number, the curve was 50 inverted by 50. It went to flat, you know, so we're still we're still historically um, flat relative to the last 20 years or so. And we think there's still 100 basis points or, or so steepening to come in multi-sector bond. Just from a positioning uh, standpoint, we actually hadn't had the steepener out. We talk about it, but we really like floating rate loans. Uh, and we we like being long duration, so we paired those with 30-year bonds. Today, we've cut our floating rate exposure to the point where we do have the steepener on. We do have a what we call a bullet position on, uh, and we are our uh, position to take advantage of a steeper curve. Yeah, What's the a bullet curve position? Steep, the curve has steepened, right? Like if you look at, look at it now, it kind of goes like this. And so the curve is inverted to the four-year, and then it's, it's positively sloped all the way out. So it's just sort of creeping in. The, the problem is the really short part of the curve can't ignore the Fed because a two-year bond in two years is cash, right? So it, it trades at Fed funds. So the two-year bond always has to have one eye on the Fed. So we do have the, the inversion, the steeper has worked for clients who have that on. It's just inside of four years is the last piece to go. And that'll happen probably starting, you know, in, in September. Right. Fascinating. There's so many questions rolling in here. So let's, some of them you've hit actually, but here, let's put this one uh, kind of on top of it. So how can we prepare, um, Jeff and Mike, prepare clients for 2026 to 2030 and beyond? Could there be a return to a zero interest rate policy? Well, that's that's going to depend on the on the data. You know, we in 2019, you know, we, nobody expected us to return to the zero interest rate policy, right? We didn't, we thought, we thought the economy was good. We thought credit spreads were, were tight, but justifiably so. We thought fu corporate fundamentals were good. Uh, and we actually thought rates were, were fairly attractive. So we had extended duration a little bit. We had cut our credit risk. Then we get a, a global pandemic and a global economic shutdown and rates go to zero. So, so yes, it's possible. It's not our base case. Uh, we do think um, higher debt levels as a percentage of D GDP probably mean lower rates going forward than we saw, say, pre-GFC, which, by the way, will be a headwind for GDP and actually is, a, is constructive for bonds. Um, it's a little counterintuitive, um, but, but going back to zero means that we're in a crisis. Um, so I don't think the Fed goes to zero outside of a crisis. I think the Fed and other central banks want arrows in the quiver. They want dry powder. They, they, you know, uh, I don't think, I think the fiscal sim stimulus, as Jeff said, um, was kind of used up for the most part during the pandemic. And I don't, I don't think that's an option right now. So I thought, I don't think the Fed um, wants to, to use all of their ammunition um, before we're in a, in a crisis, certainly not at 4.2, 4.3% unemployment. 
You know, if they if they need to stimulate the economy, you know, they've got a long way to go. They might they might be willing to use some of that, but I don't think they're going to approach anything that looks anything close to uh, a zero inch interest rate policy. Yeah, like you yeah. look at that, Mike's right. Like it's hard to look at twenty twenty six to twenty twenty thirty and and see what's next. Other than we do know that debt and demographics are monster issues that we all have to deal with, and in that regard. Like Mike said, the Fed will be tactical how it uses its QE its tools and its monetary policy. But like he also said, we may have used up our fiscal room. We may have spent it a few years ago um, and pulled forward that GDP. And so the question then for clients will be probably not right away, but down the road, how much of a slowdown is that? And then the demographics piece is mostly how do people drop out of the labor force? Because once people start dropping out of the labor force, things can get a little trickier. So a lot of question marks when you look out three or four years from now, um, but certainly you're on the right track if you're thinking debt and demographics matter. I think the Fed would agree with you. Okay, really, really interesting. Um, so could could geopolitical escalations put a hold on rate cuts? I think geopolitical yeah. escalations, um, well, it depends. I, I, first of all, I think you could see a big rally in the bond market. Which means in the rally in the bond market means you're pricing in more uh, Fed cuts, not not less. So I think you know, particularly if there's you know a, a, an economic slowdown as a result, depends on widespread, you know this this conflict uh, becomes. But yeah, it could it could actually accelerate Fed cuts, and and certainly would be good for the bond market, probably not for the equity market. I don't know if you have a different view, but uh, I, and that's I, how I would. Mike's right, it. and and I don't think it's investable for clients like. I know it's out there. There's always bad stuff happening globally. Always pick any period in your history. And so, like Mike said, you kind of have to see what it is and tactically make it a choice. Most events, though, big, big events are are treasury positive. Treasury positive. That is, I feel like that needs to go viral. <laughs> Most events are <laughs> treasury positive. Okay. Um, this is, so I, I feel like maybe there's a bit of a bubble that we all think the Bank of Canada is going to go ahead and, and do another rate cut because they kind of have told us they have. But there's always a possibility that that's not it. So this question goes to it. How real is the possibility of a Bank of Canada rate cut in September? And how might it impact the stock and also bond markets? My personal view is it's really likely to get a Bank of Canada cut. Again, 25. If you're the governor of the bank, you know, you're, you're, you are you're feel like you, you're watching housing starting to rumble. You know refinancing risk is a clear and present danger to the Canadian system. Having said that, you're also not trying to stimulate housing prices to jump higher. So you kind of got this dance going on where you're, you would, you'd want to take away refinancing risk to some extent to Canadian households. At the same time, not lead to a surge, like a monetary policy surge that sort of stimulates the, the economy and jump starts housing prices again. Uh, it's a very tricky situation. I, but I think, yeah, dial in one for the Fed at the Bank of Canada in, in September. And the other part of this is just, if the Fed goes in lockstep, then the governor doesn't have to worry about the Canadian dollar getting too, too weak, yeah. right? Interesting. Yeah, because that's that's always been sort of, yeah. it's just watching it drop like a rock is a concern. If, yeah. if that, um, fantastic. Okay, so with all of this, give us a bit of a sense of positioning. There is a question in here, you know, what, what have you sold down? Have you lessened your exposure to? Here's a question. What are your thoughts on leverage loans versus high yield? High yield's kind of held up. Um, what, where are you lessening and adding? Give us a sense of the positioning. Yeah, so we did reduce our, our leverage loan position. Still, still like the asset class, um, still like the ability to control duration separately from our credit exposure and the, and the floating rate asset class allows us to do that. But we've cut the position down to about 10%. Uh, remember, we were as high as 20% just last year. We were 20 to 15 and now to 10%. And that's also given us the flexibility to by duration where we want on the curve, which is in the belly. Um, high yield, again, default rates are, are still very low. Now they've risen from 1.5% to 3%, so the trend is in the wrong direction, but still that's historically low, and we still think corporate balance sheets are in really good shape. So I think high yield actually looks okay. Leverage loans look okay. But again, historically tight, bottom decile type spreads, uh, which means that we, we want to have a lot of dry powder because when there is a, a vol event, we don't know when it's coming, but when it does, we want to have the flexibility to add to those asset classes um, at that time and not, be, and not before that. 
So in the meantime, we have positive carry in the portfolio, a small allocation uh, to, to the plus sectors, leverage low and high yield. You know, we do the emerging market expo uh, debt exposure ourselves, um, and, and we're waiting for an opportunity because excess returns in the bond market are episodic, and we're just not in one of those episodes right now. Favorite asset class is treasuries, and so we like to be in the belly of the treasury curve, uh, keep our, 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 treasury exp our corporate uh, bond exposure to a minimum and wait for a different opportunity. We have lots of yield, and I think that this is a great time to buy bonds. Still, still fits... Um, a great time to buy bonds, and I would not change your portfolio allocations at this stage. The election coming up, probably not an investable event. You know, just leave it be and realize that the fiscal opportunity set, the fiscal room for either party is so limited now. We spent so much money in the last four or five years. Um, we've bought forward a lot of GDP, and it's going to be a, a factor into the future. Again, it's not cats and dogs living together, that kind of thing. It's just more you know, slow, slower growth than you might otherwise want. And just uh, keep in mind that yields and fixed income across all asset classes are still um, at historic highs. We're still in the top quartile in terms of the yield that you can earn on most fixed income asset classes. In a multi-sector bond fund, we're, we're placing our bets in the, in the risk-free part of the market. So U.S. Treasuries, we've taken our credit risk down. There's still some great idiosyncratic ideas so our analysts are still turning over stones and finding ideas. The same thing you hear from our, our equity portfolio managers. We're still looking for great credit stories, but we've really taken the risk in the portfolios down and we're waiting for an opportunity. We still have the beta to the fixed income markets, but we've really taken our risk down and, and, and we will, we'll take it up when the opportunity, when the bond market presents the opportunity, uh, but we're not trying to squeeze blood from a stone. When, when the alpha uh, opportunity is low, we always will take risk down and wait for the, for the better opportunity. Great. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the Fidelity Connects podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Fidelity Connects on your podcast platform of choice. And if you like what you're hearing, leave a review or a five-star rating. Fidelity Mutual Funds and ETFs are available by working with a financial advisor or through an online brokerage account. Visit fidelity.ca slash how to buy for more information. While visiting fidelity.ca, you can also find information on future live webcasts. And don't forget to follow Fidelity Canada on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thanks again. See you next time. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Fidelity Investments Canada, ULC, or its affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment, tax, or legal advice. It is not an offer to sell or buy or endorsement, recommendation, or sponsorship of any entity or security cited. Read a fund's prospectus before investing. Funds are not guaranteed. Their values change frequently, and past performance may not be repeated. Fees, expenses, and commissions are all associated with fund investments.